Hello and welcome everyone to our PICTAS members only webinar. We are excited to have Franz Herbert here again for the second in the series of three webinars. So today Franz will be talking to us about camera profiling. We had some great feedback on the first webinar, which was about monitor calibration and colour accuracy. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's on the members area on the website and it's well worth listening to. So France, along with Carl Koch, are the brains behind Basic Colour, which excitingly is now a PICTAS partner. So Basic Colour specialise in developing high quality software for calibration, monitor calibration, etc. And our members can benefit from a special discount on their quality monitor profiling software. So uh, if you go to the PICTAS website, you can download a free version or purchase the members only discounted price on the PICTAS web website. So back to the webinar. If you have any questions today, could you please put them into the chat box and hopefully France will see them during or he might answer them at the end. So we'll see how that goes. So I'd like to welcome France and hand you over for the second webinar in the series. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And welcome everybody. I'm back from beautiful Austria with my second webinar. And this time we're going to talk about profiling cameras. Today, I'm actually going to do a little presentation first and some color education so people get a behind the scenes knowledge of what camera profile is about. First question, why profile a camera? Most photographers don't even know that when they take a photo and they bring it into Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One, that they are using a camera profile. It may be from Adobe, it may be from the camera manufacturer, doesn't matter, it's, there's always a profile involved. So why not control the profile that you're actually using? Or why not create your own? for consistency, for repeatability, to make your images as similar or the same as possible from different cameras or shot with different lenses. Really, really critical for digital archival and for digital reproduction. I just took a photo of my desk before, uh, because it's a little hard to hold these things up. This is what you need for camera profiling. Not all of it, but some of it. The um, top right is probably the most well-known uh, color check of passport. A lot of photographers carry that around, maybe not to make profiles, just to, to check the color in their images. The one below is the digital color checker SG. Both were created by x -Rite. And the digital color checker SG is like the predominant color target in the uh, cultural heritage world. We'll talk more about that. On the left side is a brand new next generation target from the US that's actually made from metal. And above it is the Mansell um, linear grayscale, also produced by x ray And this little instrument there, the My Eero, is a wonderful spectrophotometer that Konica Minolta introduced a couple of years ago. So, products in photography I'm going to talk about today, basic color input to create digital camera profile, two different kinds. Adobe Photoshop Lightroom is one main application combination that people use. And Capture One is the other one for high production. We go into the details about DCP versus ICC profile. And then Basic Color has another application called Cockpit, which I'm going to show in my last webinar a month from now. And but uh, 
a uh, Photoshop Lightroom and Cockpit use digital camera and ICC profile. So what is a digital camera? What is it trying to do? It attempts to simulate the human eye and it attempts to produce pretty pictures. That's the biggest problem that we have if we want to faithfully capture an original. It can be used as a colorimeter, which is what we're going to demonstrate today for accurate reproduction with a colorimetric transformation. In essence, trying to make a measurement instrument out of a camera. And that is a color profile for a certain light source, for a certain material that gets measured either as a spectrum or in LAB. What that is, I'm going to talk about in a second too. The digital camera profile or called DCP profile is part of Adobe's digital negative specification. It's a public format for the archival of raw images. Raw formats are specific to camera manufacturer, but DNG is a free standard from Adobe and they have a free converter. DCP profiles get mainly used in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to call that ACR from now on. So Lightroom, Photoshop, Bridge, but there are some other applications like Iridian Developer, Raw Therapy, DxO Photo Lab 2 that use them. So again, DCP profile, mostly by ACR. A photo, a raw uh, photo gets developed and then converted into working space in ACR. On the contrary, ICC profiles, like used by Capture One and by Focus from Hasselblad. You can also use them in Photoshop on any kind of imagery, TIFFs, JPEGs, PNG, and ICC profiles are applied after the raw development. Now let's look at the detail. What is a DCP profile? What does it consist of? So the heart of it is a three by three matrix that converts RGB data into XYZ data. Again, I'm going to explain a little later what XYZ stands for. And there is only one curve and that's in luminance. And the curve is optional. And there's also an optional Q sat map, which can do a correction in two and a half D without the lightness or in 3D with the lightness. So we can create a three dimensional map that for a given hue saturation lightness corrects it to another one in any precision. There's also the possibility to embed two transformations in one DCP profile. One would be a tungsten shot, a, a calibration for tungsten shot and one for a daylight shot. And then in the ACR control panel, when you move the color temperature slider, you, the software would interpolate between those two transformations. On the other hand, ICC profile is a three, uh, contains a three by four matrix with offset, again, RGB to XYZ or RGB to LAB. It can have three input curves. It can have three output curves, eight or 16 bits per color entry and 3D table. This is one um, possibility of an ICC profile. There are other uh, possibilities that we're not using at this point for camera profiling. And here on the right side, you can see what a ICC profile actually looks like. And here is the tag that converts from RGB to XYZ. You can see down there is a matrix in curves. This is a table out curves. This is a 3D view of it. And here we see the steps on how a digital camera works. Most digital camera sensors use a so-called Bayer pattern. That's on the, on the very left that has one pixel for red, one for blue, 
and two for green. Green is also used for luminance. So if you look at a raw photo, they're always looking very greenish. And these, uh, this capture is developed into a continuous cone um, color in 10, 12, 14, 16 bits per color channel put together as RGB. And then it needs a three by three matrix that you see on the right to convert into what a reasonable looking image. Basic color input six creates DCP profiles for ACR, for Lightroom, Photoshop, and it creates ICC profiles for Capture One, Photoshop, and any other application that uses ICC profiles, like Preview, for example, on the Mac, or you know, most any application today uses ICC profiles, has, has been an international standard for 25 years at least. From various color targets, and I, I showed you a few of those before, we'll go more into, into this after that. Adobe has a free DNG profile editor that allows you actually to edit a base profile for a specific um, uh, camera. The reason I'm showing you this is because this curve that's drawn in red here, this is very important. If a camera DCP profile does not have a curve embedded, then ACR automatically applies the default curve, which is this red curve, which is a typical film curve. Uh, Capture One has their uh, film curve that looks similar to this that will open up any image. Another term I'm going to use today that I would like to explain is metamorphism. Metamorphism is when two uh, originals are being viewed under two different lights. You see at the top the spectrum of one light, it doesn't have much in the blue area. The blue is like towards the ultraviolet. And, and as a result, the two samples on the left at the bottom look identical. On the other hand, if you use a light that has uh, UV, for example, and you have uh, optical brightness in this original, for example, then you will see that these two samples look very, very different. This is called metamorphism. And we deal with metamorphism all the time because we're looking at originals on the different light sources. You go into the store, you buy an object, you buy a shampoo bottle, you take it outside, it looks different outside, you take it home, it looks different in, um, in your home, in your home lighting. And that's the major challenge that manufacturers um, of these packages have to deal with to create packaging that is reasonably free of metamorphism or look, uh, objects that look similar under different lights. Okay, a little bit of color mathematics here. A spectrum gets converted to CIE XYZ. XYZ is kind of uh, a mathematical version of red, green, blue. So trying to simulate uh, uh, the filters that we have in our eyes was defined 1931. And from this is derived what used to be called the L star, A star, B star, which is um, based on lightness and um, a circle. I show a diagram in a second. Now it's just referred to as lab space or LAB space. The CIE is the Commission Internationale de l'Eclairage, was founded in 1913 when electrical lights came out and used to switch from country to country. It has a seat now in Vienna, but every year uh, the president is from a different country. So it's a super international organization that specifies all of these color definitions, color conversions. So when I use color conversions in my product, 
they are actually defined by the CIE. And here we see the color matching functions for red, green, and blue. So these are used to uh, applied to a spectrum. And from that, we get red, green, and blue components. These are X, Y, Z. And on the right side, we have a shoe sole where this is flattened into a two-dimensional chromaticity diagram. And here on the right side, we see the Planckian locus. That black line is uh, when you heat up a black body, it starts to emit light in a very warm temperature. As in the diagram on the left, you see 3200 Kelvin is a low temperature. That's typical for a tungsten light in our house. The next one, if you heat it up more, the light gets more bluer and bluer. 5,000 Kelvin is the printing standard, but it's still quite warm. 6,500 is daylight, uh, daylight standard that is being used on the internet. And then it goes on from there. And uh, on this diagram, we travel on, along this, li uh, this line. So a light source can never be bright green or magenta. This is a white. If you look at it long enough or you're close enough, our eyes completely adapt to that. I mean, if you close your eyes and open them again now, you look at this long enough, this looks white as well. But these whites are actually quite far apart. That's the interesting part that our eyes calibrate to the most bluish white that we can see. And that makes it often tricky. You have to watch out in what color temperature you view things. So here we come to the C-Lab color space. You see in the left, lightness goes from black to white. And then we have a hue circle around. And in the, so in the center is the grayscale. And we have four corner points, red, yellow, green, and blue. And the more, the farther out you go, the more chromatic it gets. This is my preferred color space. And it's, it's much more intuitive. If you have a hue angle, you see that a hue of zero degrees is always red, uh, a hue of 90, that's yellow, and so on. And chroma is easily determined in one number. You don't have to look at A and B and plus and minus. So um, this is the most intuitive color space. The interesting thing about LAB and LCH is that it's not a sphere. Yellow only exists as a very light color and blue only exists as a, as a fairly dark color. So quality control, that's the next step. How do we determine how accurate a color is? So we just looked at the LAB space. So quality control is defined by a, um, a color difference in LAB. It's called delta E. And the idea was always that one delta E is the minimal amount of difference that our eyes can see visible color difference. The first LTE was defined in 1976, and it was a strict Euclidean distance in LAB space. In 94, they refined it, and in 2000 again, because they discovered that the model was too simple, that we are not very sensitive to large chromatic differences as long as the hue angle doesn't change. But for example, we are very sensitive to very small differences along the grayscale. And the latest is uh, a version of Delta A2000 with a linear function on the lightness in the color math. And here's an example. So this is a gray, and here are two grays. It's difficult to determine whether you will actually be able to see that, but if you if you look at um, this on a computer, on a good computer later on, maybe you can see it. So one 
yellow, a second yellow, and here are two yellows. And you should see a vertical line, actually. There's a difference between the, the left and the right side. So in gray, the delta E76 was 0.44, but in delta E2000 was 1.35, because it was definitely visible. And the yellow, um, again, 0 0.63, up, sorry, in the yellow, <laughs> the difference is now 0 0.63 um, and 1.85. Okay. So on the yellow, you see, uh, with the pure Euclidean distance is actually 10 delta E, but it's barely visible. So with the delta E 2000, it's only two delta E. Quality control is very, very important. So in cultural heritage preservation, where museums have to archive their artwork, their paintings, uh, they needed to set guidelines, what is acceptable. So in Europe, we had this metamorphose preservation imaging guidelines. And the old version used Delta E76. In the US, there was a FAGI standard, which still exists, modified, and they were using Delta E2000. Um, two years ago, this merged into a new ISO standard worldwide that used this new formula, the modified Delta E2000. And it defines tolerances for specific color targets. So when a photographer gets a job from, uh, for a museum, he has to prove that he can create a color profile that fulfills the standard. And that's what um, I'm going to demonstrate to you today. So this is the new generation target from digital transitions in the US that is now the preferred target of choice for cultural heritage. And here are the tolerances for the ISO standard. So the average delta E has to be less than four, maximum delta E less than 10, and then gray patches are dealt with separately. They have to have a delta AB, so without the lightness, under three, and the gain modulation is a formula that determines the overall um, equivalence that a 50% gray doesn't move to 60 or to 70. So again, archival product photography. Here's an example. I took a whole bunch of packages out of my kitchen and I photographed it. And then I took specific color spots and measured them with spectrophotometer and inserted them on the image. On the, here's the red, here's the green, here's the yellow, here's the cyan, orange, and another green. This was only possible after I made a art reproduction profile. If you try to do this, with normal camera with just any profile, you will see that these colors will wildly vary. So let's look at Capture One first, which is predominant application for a lot of uh, photographers. They love the functionality and they have to process lots and lots of images. Capture One loads a raw file but then you have to export a TIFF. And uh, Capture One puts a special transfer curve in the TIFF. You have to select the curve. In this case, uh, I'm visualizing these curves. Capture One gives me this curve to go, that I can use to convert the data back into the original raw data, at least the RGB uh, portion of it. And so you can see the slight differences here the big difference with film standard, which is what most people use for photography, then there's a high contrast and an extra shadow. Okay, 
So now we're going to actually use basic color input to do a camera calibration. I'm going to show you pieces of, this is a list of all the targets that we actually support. There's a lot of them from all around the world and you can create your own if you like to. As the first test, I'm going to show you, it will create a profile for the digital, for the uh, color checker passport photo. And I'm gonna say start profiling. I have an image of the color checker SG and there's a reason for that. that I'm going, because we're going to profile the whole digital color checker SG and then afterwards we're going to compare them. So I already cropped this, the um, color checker SG actually contains a color checker passport here. So I'm just going to grab this and make a, and it says capture one. So the software automatically detects that the tip comes from capture one. And I'm going to use art repro for my first profile. And here we go. And we display Delta E2000 in this case, see that I have 2.7 del C as my maximum error shows right here. And my average error is, uh, a median error is 1.1. So this is a really, really excellent result. But be that as it may, we're going to see how good this profile really is later on. Okay, now, Let's actually go through the process and how we make a profile for Capture One. So I shot a color checker SG with a Canon camera. This is a CR2 file. And here we see the default is a generic profile that is being used by Capture One. The curve is set to auto and I'm going to set it to linear response. If I want to do art reproduction or art archival, I do need a profile in linear response. For people that like to shoot portraits uh, and landscapes, I also recommend they make a second profile with, uh, with the film standard curve and then they can use both of them depending on what kind of originals they have. Now, the next step is we have to see how um, light this is. I've activated uh, the um, LAB readout here. And so I can see up here, the white has an L of 85.3. Now, if I would make a profile uh, for this right now, the profile would actually lighten up every image because this is too dark. And why is it too dark? We're going to look at that. So we actually have measurements for this target in LAB or spectrally. And when you buy the software, it comes with a whole bunch of different measurement files included. So there's different uh, versions from 2014, from 2004. So in this case, I have the 2019 edition. And if I go look here, it says my L is measured 96.6. .6. So I need to match that in my, uh, in Capture One so that my profile does not darken 
or brighten any images that I shoot. What this shows you as well is um, what these patches actually are used for. On the color checkers G, there are white patches that we uh, use to look at how even the illumination is. And these black patches are semi-glossy. So we look at the reflectivity of that as well. Here are primary colors that we use for color correction and the GB stands for gray balance. So these are uh, specifically designed gray patches. So for example, the ISO standard specifies these as grays uh, for the Delta E analysis for the preservation guidelines. Okay, so back to capture one. The other thing I wanna do, I want to um, set my gray balance. Because if my gray balance isn't perfect and I profile it, then the profile will change the gray balance because it will say, okay, this is too red, but the reference data is perfectly neutral. So I make everything less red, but that you don't want the profile to do that on, on, on every image that you have. So for this, actually, let's go back and take another look here. What the, um, we, we want to use the, the most neutral patch to do the gray balance. And you see this, the chroma here is 0 0.3, here is 0 0.2. So this patch, H5, is the ideal patch for gray balancing. So I'm going to go up here and click on that. And you see up here how the values change. And the next thing is now we have to change the luminance. So we have 85.3. So I need to brighten this quite a bit. We're at 96.3 now. Okay, that's, I don't think I'm going to get closer than that. What is really important is that you do not do this brightening in an exposure control because exposure controls are always non-linear and that will screw up uh, the profile. So now I've set the image I, as I want it to be. And now I actually have to export this with an embed camera profile. If you don't set this, then Capture One will convert this into whatever other profile is set here. So that is critical that you do this here. And then I say process and this gets saved as a TIFF. Now we switch back to basic color display and I will import this TIFF. And you see it says capture one. And here I have a loop I can actually look at raw percent. I can look at the black. So the black is around 5%. So you see that the, light, the lighting is even. We're green on all the whites and we're green on all the blacks. That is not that easy to do, to set up lighting properly that uh, a target of this size is evenly illuminated. There are ways to improve that by doing a, a lightness control at LCC in, in Capture One, where you have a gray card and you take a shot of the gray card and then you can create an LCC that would divide out any differences. But we're happy with this. And now we have to actually name this profile. I'm gonna call this repro because I wanna do an art repro. Here now I can determine what um, quality control uh, mechanism I want to use. And it says if I use the, the ISO, it sets this Delta E automatically. So that's what I want to try to achieve, the top level standard. And now I'm going to make an ICC profile for Capture One. And here we go, 50% quantile is 
one delta E and 100% is 4.8. And I am green. I have a perfect metamorphose um, full quality standard achieved. Here, I can block out the delta E. I can look at each patch. What they do, we'll go into this later. Here's a, a gray correction. Let's see what that did here. Actually made delta E, a eh, little better. And this profile gets stored automatically in the proper place in the color sync profiles um, directory on the Mac or in the color directory on the Windows. So capture one, we'll see it. I have to quit capture one, unfortunately. It doesn't update automatically, but I quit it and I restart it. And now you see my two profiles that I made are actually here. So I'm going to select the repro profile and I'm going to go back here. And because remember we were going to actually check what the difference is if I, between these two profiles and see, the profile that I made with the color checker passport actually has a delta E of 13. So even when I made it, it said, oh, everything is hunky-dory. It is not nearly as good a profile for digital archival as the profile that I made with this color checker as G. There are many reasons for that. One is that there are so many more grayscales on here. Also, this target is made from several pigments. So it's specifically made for art uh, archival and art reproduction. We can here click on the report and then we get a very, very detailed report for every patch. And at the bottom, it says ISO level A pass. Okay, but now we would actually like to see, to check what the delta E is. If now, if I convert this target to Profoto now, I wanna see what happens if I use this profile in a workflow, can I still maintain the delta E that I got when I created it? So I process this and it gets, it converts to the ICC profile pro photo here, which is a very large color space that a lot of uh, photographers use for their working space. And now I'm going to start, go back and I'm going to import the pro photo file. And when there is a profile attached, we automatically evaluate it against the, the measurements that we have for this particular preset. And see, we actually have maintained, actually we even got better by, by two tenths. We have a maximum of four and, uh, and a uh, quantile of 1.1. So this proves that we managed to really um, fulfill the ISO preservation guidelines when converting an image through this R3 profile, repro profile that we made. Okay, next. The next big thing that we need to do is make a DCP profile for Adobe Camera Raw. So for that, 
we drag the raw file, the CR2 file, into basic color input. And you see here now it converts the raw file and it tells us from this, it can only make a DCP profile. Let me show you some, some things here. We actually tried to determine automatically, you know, uh, the corner points doesn't always work 100%, but if you're outside of this, you see that uh, wherever the averaging of the pixels that we do has too big of a spread, we inform the user that this is not positioned correctly. I also want to show you actually what choices we have actually to make a profile. So we have DCP profile, we can do our repro. We have something called repro plus that doesn't use an embedded curve. Um, doesn't give you the very, very best Delta E like the art repro, but it amps up the images slight bit and it's for photographers that just need to shoot something in a museum or um, it gives you great color accuracy with, uh, with a bit more power, bit contrast enhancement that you would get with our repo. Photography, uh, typically oversaturated images, but a lot of images actually look great if you use a photography profile. And you can make a grayscale profile. Quality control, we went through that before. Temperature, we can do a two illuminant temperature for, with a DCP profile. We can turn the color either on. We have the white point compensation. We can do an auto exposure. You can turn uh, gray added on. And this is our own shading. So if you want to do uh, the shading in input with a second shot of the gray card, you can do it here. But as a photographer, you don't want this only applied to a profile. You really would like to have this um, for all images anyway. So capture one profile, we have a special option here. If you like your generic, uh, the behavior of your generic uh, profile, you can actually mimic that here. And other than that, it's similar. And then a generic ICC profiles, same thing. So now oh, we have to track this thing again, sorry. We make a DCP profile. And we have a couple of blacks here. But this particular exercise, I'm not too worried about it. I can go back and work on that if I have to. And here now you can see our color correction dialog. So these, the primaries were set by the job, by the preset, and then in between on each target, I try to find the color in between. So we have 12 colors actually that we identified around the hue circle that are being used. And, and if I go through here and see, Delta E 0 0.9, 0 0.8 on red, 1.1, 0 0.5, 1.2. So the numbers are really, really low. Um, these profiles get put into a folder that where Adobe uh, finds the profile. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to actually switch to Adobe Camera Raw and here, you would get your standard Adobe color, which does not have an embedded profile. In my R3 pro profile, I did put a curve in that is quasi-linear, I call that. So I wanna find that, so I have to go to browse, and here under profiles, this shows up now. And you notice it uh, gets quite a bit darker so I have to actually, what well, we did, similar thing that we did in Capture One to begin with, I have to use a linear curve to 
I have a LAB up here, 94 to get back to 96.6, 97, that's very close. Since we cannot only simulate the raw converter that uh, Adobe uses, uh, this process is not as precise as it is with Capture One. And specifically, uh, Adobe just comes out with new versions and new versions of, uh, of this, this uh, engine. And right now we're on version five. The cultural heritage people say you should go back to version two. So uh, it doesn't, the Adobe doesn't do so much like try to get out more and more detail out of the highlight and stuff. Uh, some of my customers, they go along the grayscale and uh, they create a curve that specifically matches like the grayscale here on the target. The one thing I wanna show you here now, what we can do. Um, if you have a painting, for example, that has a pigment on it, that um, colorimetry doesn't capture correctly. So uh, let's assume this red here does not look this red in reality. You can actually correct this here. You can do correction. I'm doing going to do something dramatic. Let's say I'll make the hue of the red much more magenta. So I go minus 25. And you can see here that this went more magenta. And if I click here, whoops. Let me do it a little more. Ah, it's not you. Oh, that's why it's not using my profile. I have to go back to my profile. Let me reset this. And here I'm gonna make these favorites so I have access to them. And now, if I go minus 25 and I click on here, you see how magenta this was. So every time I click on here, if I reset, I create an, a new profile and I just have to click. So I can do live color correction in Adobe Camera Raw. Okay, this brings me to the end of my presentation. This was color profiling with basic color input. Oh, wait, there's one more thing I forgot. Here's a little short video on how to use, how to actually measure a target in basic color input. We support x i1 Pro 1, 2, 3, 3 plus, and this My Eero from Konica Minolta. So if you have one of these measurements, you can measure your own targets. All these instruments have a button on the side so you can position it on a specific patch and click on it. You can specify the name of your reference file. And here you can use this guide. This is what I did to measure my NGT2 target very precisely. What I also did with basic color display which I demonstrated in my last webinar, I measured actually my overhead viewing light that I was using to photograph my digital, uh, my NGT2 target. And I can save the spectrum and actually use it as the illuminant in my profiling process. If I have the measurements 
spectrally, which all of these instruments do that we support. And so I told the profiling process to use the spectrum that we measured, and then I created a profile from a raw file and this profile had exceptional quality, as you will see in a moment. So here, positioning. Again, ISO level A and boom. 100% Delphi 2.0. It doesn't get any better than that. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? The front, I can see a question for you. Um, to profile a camera, contrary to what we learned on the previous webinar about profiling the monitor, we only need this software and a color checker. No other hardware is needed. Is that correct? That is correct. Great, thank you. Has anybody else got any questions? You can raise your hand if you want to, and uh, answer. And um, we can ask. You can ask it directly. I think there's all, all, always so much information in your webinars that it kind of, <laughs> it floods in. So maybe- Has anybody, anybody, let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever profiled their camera that, that are online? I haven't. That's not something that you normally do unless uh, you get tasked with creating imagery, you know, for, for very, very specific purposes. Yeah. Like clothing, for example. I had a photographer, one uh, who was shooting clothing lines and what they did is like, they got three t-shirts in different colors, but then 12 more color samples. So they had to actually oh. create, they had to colorize one wow. of the other t-shirts to create the full sequence. And at first they said like, that's not gonna help me, you know, with the color profiling, but it turns out with the calibrated the profile camera, it took them half the time to create these colorizations. Wow. Um, they, they could do them in one step rather than in two or three. So that's quite costly in time saving, isn't it? You know, you save a lot of money by doing that. Absolutely, because yeah. these days photographers don't get much money for the photos oh. anymore. So it's all about how quickly, how, how little time can I spend to get the very best photo? Yeah, that's brilliant. That's really good. So uh, we've got some more questions for you. So um, Katrine has asked, I have X-Rite color checker. Can I apply the same to this? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, another question from Katrine. I use Lightroom. Can I make profiles there too? What I was showing is Adobe Camera Raw. This that is used in Lightroom exactly the same way as in Photoshop. I showed it in Photoshop. Um, but it's it's all Adobe. So these profiles, the DCP profiles, will be used in all of Adobe's applications. That's great. Um, any more questions, anyone? So I was thinking, actually, because um, Franz and Carl are both uh, PICTAS members. If anybody does have any questions, we you can ask them in, in the members area on the website as well. Because I think people might want to go away and digest the things that you're you've said. I can understand <laughs> that. There's a lot. <laughs> well, in my last webinar a month from now, I'm actually going to look at the big picture. I'm going to talk about color management. You know, take a step back. Now we were doing very specific things, but I I want to spend some time to educate people in how this all relates, you know, from input to output to monitors, to printers and stuff. If you, if, yeah, and uh, that's going to be coming in March. 
that sounds brilliant. And I was actually going to ask you what was your last webinar on because I couldn't remember the title. So thank you. <laughs> we'll call it Colour Management, the whole nine yards. Oh, that sounds brilliant. I'm looking forward to that. So um, you were going to talk to us about some uh, software that you've got on offer yes, as well. Yes, we, we have a special offer for Pictus members, um, which will be published on the Pictus website soon. We offer you the Input Pro version for the price of the regular input version. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. So there'll be a couple of um, things that you can look at on there. So anybody that goes to the page can see the two that you've talked about in the last two webinars. So that's fabulous, thank you. Um, is there any more questions? Has anyone else got a question? I'm sure you're gonna get a lot on the, on the website <laughs> when everybody's- No problem. I, I, I talk with my own customers, you know, on a regular basis when they have very difficult cases and stuff. I yeah, it's like, this software is used by many, many museums around the world. Yeah. The Library of Congress in Washington recommends the software to museums because a lot of times the photographers of museums are not, they're more technicians than real photographers. So they need applications that are push button and, and basic color input gives you reliable push button results without having to do a lot of tweaking. That's what it's famous for around the planet from Russia, from the Hermitage to Reich Museum wow. in Amsterdam to the Getty and the MoMA uh, and the Metropolitan in that's New a, York. That's a big list, a big list of quality places. And many more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that just shows how, how good this software is. So please take the advantage of it on our, our webinar, um, on our website, sorry. And um, if you've got any questions, I'm sure France will answer them later on for you. You've got lots of clapping and heart signs. Yeah, I see that. Video, Thank you so very much. Really <laughs> and I hope to to talk of some of you, to some of you or many of you in person. That's lovely. Thanks so much, France. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And um, definitely make a date on your diary for the third third webinar with France because it sounds great. The whole nine yards, brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, friends. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>